Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the second in our series of four Sussex Uncovered webinars. I'm Corinne Day, a trustee at Sussex Community Foundation and director of New Haven Enterprise Zone. Today we hope to uncover and look at in a little more depth some of the urgent issues facing people and communities across Sussex. So onto the agenda for today, we will start with a short introduction and background from me on behalf of the foundation. We will then hear from three key speakers from local groups working to offer expert advice and support to their beneficiaries. This will be followed by a question and answer session with our speakers, joined by Stephen Chamberlain, Head of Philanthropy at Sussex Community Foundation. Finally, Stephen will then give a roundup and thanks, and we will ensure we will finish by 5 p.m. at the latest. Before we start, I just want to go through some housekeeping for those who may be new to Zoom webinars. We encourage you to comment through the session via the chat box. Please make sure to send all panellists and attendees so everyone can see your thoughts. When we get to the Q&A session, please also put your questions in the chat box. We have some which have been submitted already, but we will try to answer as many as we can or via email after the event. Finally, we are recording this webinar and it will be available to watch on our YouTube channel in a few days. So why did the foundation want to run these webinars? We wanted to look in more detail at key areas of work taking place in our communities to shine a light on the local issues and the amazing groups helping to address them and learn more to inform our own grant making. As many of you will know, in the spring, following consultation with the voluntary sector in Sussex, we decided to relaunch the Sussex Crisis Fund for the support and recovery phase. From these discussions, the relaunch fund had a narrower focus, which included advice and support services as one of the five themes. Over the next hour, we will hear from three groups delivering hugely important work in this area, covering general advice, including financial and benefits advice, advice for Syrian refugees and asylum seekers, and advice and support for women of all backgrounds facing different issues. Whilst the Sussex Crisis Fund is now closed, we are delighted to have given out over £4 million in emergency funding during the pandemic in over 700 grants. Before I introduce today's speakers, I wanted to give a bit of background to why access to expert and knowledgeable advice and support is so important. The colours on this map show the Hardship Fund vulnerability score according to tri criteria developed by the British Red Cross as of June 2020. This analysis aims to highlight the local authorities where people are likely to be hardest hit by the economic fallout of COVID, the darker the areas being the more vulnerable. So for example, this includes where adults and children are in families receiving income-based job seekers allowance, or where asylum seekers are in receipt of subsistence or accommodation support. The pandemic has increased inequality in the UK and in Sussex, and the work being done by local groups to support people who are already experiencing disadvantage is never more needed. In 2018-19, there were £15 billion worth of unclaimed means-tested benefits across the UK, with at least 7 million people not claiming. Pensioners are most likely to not be receiving what they're entitled to. One in three are missing out on pension credit. Asylum seekers who are waiting for an outcome on their asylum claim are not allowed to work in the UK. They rely on just £37.75 a week from the government. At the end of March this year, 66,185 people were waiting for an outcome on their initial claim for asylum. Perhaps the current situation in Afghanistan will serve to raise awareness of other communities in similar situations. In Sussex, from data gathered over 2015 to 2019, there is a staggering 14 year gap in female life expectancy between the most deprived and the least deprived areas. At Sussex Community Foundation, we have a long history of funding local charities and community groups that support people with advice. During the pandemic, this area of work ramped up and we gave a huge amount of funding to groups supporting people in this way. We hope that today's speakers will help us all to understand more about the impactful work these organisations are doing in their communities, what is required and where our funds are most needed. Therefore, I'm delighted to welcome our speakers today, who are Jackie Wilkes, District Manager at Lewis District Citizens Advice, Ahmad Yabrudi, Chair of Sussex Syrian Community Group, and Jenny Johnson, Chief Operating Officer at Brighton Women's Centre. So each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes and then we will open the floor for Q&As at that point. Please put your questions in the chat box throughout. Don't feel you have to wait until all the speakers have finished. Send them in whenever you have them. So on to our first speaker, Jackie Wilkes from Lewis District Citizens Advice. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much, Corrine. Um, 
I wanted to start by giving you an overview of our service. Um, it'll be fairly high level. And so if you have something you, that you find particularly interesting, then please come back to me at the end, either through the chat um, or in the Q&A, and, and I can take it up. The first thing I want to, to say, and it's something that is, a, is often a real misconception, is that we are an independent local charity. We don't receive any government funding unless for specific projects. Um, our advice is free. It's available to everybody. It's confidential, impartial and independent. There's no restrictions on who can access us for advice. And unlike my fellow speakers, we are generalists. We advise on any topic at all. Um, debt, benefits, consumer, immigration, housing, you name it, we'll advise you on it. There are absolutely no limits at all. The other misconception is that we're all solicitors. We're not. We're not legally trained. And most of our advisors are volunteers. At the moment, we have 45 volunteers uh, working uh, across the district, and we have they're supported by a small team of 15 part time paid staff. So pre pandemic, we had three offices in Lewis, Seaford and New Haven. We had outreach in food banks, libraries, day centers, community halls, but we were predominantly a face to face organization. We give three levels of advice. What well, tier one advice is a short sort of 15 minute interview. Many of our clients, probably about 70% have their problems. Um, we help them within that first period. It's probably actually more like 15 to 30 minutes. A lot of people, they need a little bit more. So we would arrange for them to have a further interview with sort of tier two. And then for people with really complex problems who can't cope on their own, we have caseworkers who would work with them on an ongoing basis. Our advice is holistic. We, we, are, we train our advisors to tease out the problems that our clients come to us with. So very often the client will present with an issue which isn't really the main, the main concern. And we, 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 we have to talk to them, we explore their situation, and we find out all the different areas that are concerning them. And we just work through them one by one, very often in multiple appointments. And our aim is to empower clients, not to take over, but to empower them, to help them, to walk with them, to, to solve their problems and help them have a better life. So at the end of March last year, this everything changed. Having been completely or almost entirely face to face, we all had to move off site to set and we were set up to work from home with laptops and, and telephones. Since then, we've been delivering advice by phone, email, web chat and we've recently started video conferencing and from our new haven office but still very little face to face uh, i've been asked to talk a little bit about our training um, our volunteers come from a wide range of backgrounds and our um, our recruitment process is, is competitive we interview people and we do sometimes have to turn people down because what we expect of them is really quite intense uh, all the volunteers are trained in eight advice areas, including debt, benefits, employment, consumer, immigration, multiple topics. And it can, for the tier two advice level, it can take a volunteer up to a year to be fully trained before they can actually start seeing clients at that level. For our sort of tier one triage level, it's about six months. But we do ask a huge commitment from them, and it requires a lot of self study. But at the end, the training they've got is, is very highly respected. And quite a lot of our volunteers go on to get paid work when they leave us. So it's a nice sort of circular thing. We train them and then they go back. We help, they help the community and then we help them to get jobs within the community. The types of issues that we uh, deal with uh, are varied, as I've said. Uh, we normally see about three and a half thousand clients a year and we help them with over 10,000 problems. And since the start of the pandemic, what we've seen is the client's issues are becoming ever more complex and multi-layered. We've also seen a new type of client, people who've never needed our help before, and who were totally managing their lives pre-pandemic. But many local people have low financial resilience, and it doesn't take much to knock them off course. So the loss of a job or being put on furlough um, can make all the difference because most of our clients, they won't have savings. So they've, they've got no backup plan. 
And if you think if you're on a low salary, although furlough is better than being made redundant, if you're on a low salary, a 20% cut in wages is still going to have a huge impact on you. Similarly, if you're used to working and you lose a job and you have to apply for universal credit, it's going to be a real financial shock. I mean, I think probably most people know that financial that UC is not a, a generous benefit. And for people who've been used to managing and setting their budgets um, on a salary to go to universal credit is, is going to cause problems. And universal credit was set up by the government to make work pay. But obviously, in the last year, for some people, there have been few opportunities in some sectors to get new jobs. So they've had to rely on universal credit. So it, it, we've seen a lot of people falling into debt. And the other thing that we've noticed in the last year is that our most vulnerable clients have gone to ground and we haven't seen them. And we think this is because they're not coping with the digital channels that we're offering at the moment. So we are starting to set up some face to face advice in our New Haven office. Um, so that those most um, vulnerable clients can come and, and see us there. So I just wanted to run over some headline figures for the year, which give you a sort of feel for what's been happening. So 64% of the clients we've seen in the last year have never needed our help before. So they're completely new clients who have be previously been managing. We've had a 115% increase in applications for universal credit. And also staggeringly, a 190% increase in requests for advice on redundancy. But the most telling figure, and one which is very timely, is that 75% of the families that we're helping to manage their budgets at the moment will be tipped into a negative budget if the £20 uplift in universal credit is removed. So this is scheduled to happen at the end of September, but we are campaigning hard with the government to get the Chancellor to retain the uplift, because for our clients, although £20 to many of us may seem like nothing, it's £1,000 a year, and that just makes a huge difference and will tip people into debt, and we really need to work together to make sure that doesn't happen. So for many of our clients, things are about to get worse because so many of the government protections are about to be withdrawn. Furlough is going to come to an end. UC uplift may come to an end. Bailiff activity will increase. Evictions, which were banned throughout the pandemic, then that, that's now being lifted. So homelessness will rise. The lifting of the utility bill cap is also going to come in. And many of our clients are on prepayment meters, which means that that's the highest rate you can get. And for them, it could be another £149 a year on their bills. And then as of yesterday, the NI increase. So these are all things that are going to negatively impact on our client, our clients. But I wanted to also tell you about some positives because it's estimated that the value of our advisors' time, if we paid them commercially, would be about £400,000 a year. So that's something that local people are doing for their own community. And so it's sort of building the community, the wealth of the community, and, and it, it feeds a feeling of well-being. We're also proud, justly proud of what we call benefit gains. This is the benefit get help. This is, these are the benefit entitlements that we help clients to apply for often with life-changing event uh, results. And then the last year, we our total benefit gain figure was 1.2 million pounds. So that's money that people are going to spend locally. They're not going to go off on holiday. They're not going to get on the train to London. They're going to spend it in our local shops, local businesses. And this will really pay a major part in our local recovery. I wanted just to touch on the funding outlook because Many organisations such, organizations such as Sussex Community Foundation and, and donors such as yourselves can really play a huge part in, in, the, in the recovery. Huge amounts of money have been paid out in the last year for COVID, and rightly so. But that means that I think there's going to be a, a real struggle to get funding in the next few years. And I think many charities may even go under. So what I would like to say to, to you as donors is please consider giving money for core funding as well as projects, because that's what's going to make charities keep going. And also remember that innovation doesn't always mean better. Repeat funding for an existing project, which is working really well, is just as important to us as funding for a new idea. 
And I'd like to finish up um, reading you a couple of case histories to just give you an idea of the sort of thing that we deal with on a daily basis. They're not particularly complex, but I think they're multifaceted and they just give you a good idea of, of, of what, it's, what it's like for our clients. So case study one, a client with learning difficulties came to us after he'd been furloughed from his part-time job in the hospitality sector. His furlough meant that he was struggling financially and we had already provided him with both fuel and food vouchers to help him manage. Universal credit is usually applied for online, but due to low levels of literacy, the client needed to make a claim by phone. When he contacted the Department of Work and Pensions claim phone service, they refused to help him because they didn't understand his educational needs and that he had a right to make a phone claim. After assessing the client's needs, we contacted the Department of Work and Pensions claim phone line on his behalf and established his right to make a phone claim. Having established this right, the DWP arranged the client to speak to the local job centre on the very same day and complete his claim. The client was awarded the standard basic universal credit amount, which he said would make a huge difference while he was on furlough. And because he was on a very low salary, he would probably continue to receive some universal credit when he back, went back to full work, full time work. So this is a really simple story, but one which ably demonstrates how some clients with additional needs are not able to navigate the system on their own. The second case history relates to an 84 year old widow who was concerned about the reliability of a 30 year old boiler, which she couldn't afford to replace. She explained to our advisor that she lives alone, suffers from arthritis, chronic kidney failure and angina. She also experiences some memory loss. Having assessed the situation in a 15 minute triage interview, our advisor made an appointment for a follow up telephone call during which we were able to explore a number of funding opportunities and help the client to make an application to Lewis District Council for £2,000 to cover the cost of a new boiler. We were also able to make sure that she was placed on the priority services register, which amongst other benefits means you have a free gas safety check and priority help if the supply fails. In the, appoint in the same appointment, we checked that she was in receipt of the warm homes discount and reviewed her benefit entitlement. As we've just mentioned earlier, um, elderly people don't always play for their, uh, apply for the right benefits. So we discovered during the conversation that her award for pension credit and attendance allowance had remained unchanged for many years, despite her failing health. So with her permission, we did some follow up work on her behalf and obtained medical certificates and reporting it, supporting evidence before we submitted a revised claim. The outcome for this client was a £2,000 a uh, grant from Lewis District Council for a new boiler, an increase in both attendance allowance and pension credit, plus a listing on the priority ser services register. These were not particularly complex cases, but I do think they give you an overview of the work we do. So I'd just like to finish by thanking you all so much for your support and for listening to me this afternoon. Um, and I hope you rest enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was a really interesting presentation, um, not only in terms of outlining the complexity of issues, the changing client base, but the kind of staggering increase in numbers, but really about how the advice and the impact of CAB on people's resilience and empowerment in a crisis. So that was, that was really interesting. Thank you. Please, everyone, if you have any questions, um, do put them in the chat box. We've had them coming through and we'll take them in the Q&A at the end of the session. So I'd like to go on to our second speaker, Ahmad Gabrudi. He's the chair of the Sussex Syrian Community Group. So over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Ahmad Gabrudi, the Sussex Syrian Community Chairman. Uh, our community was established in 2016 in response to the critical and ongoing needs of newly arrival Syrian refugees. Our group is run entirely by Syrian volunteers for the Syrian community. We are from a diverse range of ethnic and religious background. Our group is a reflection of the diverse population of Syria who have lived in harmony together for centuries and thousands of years. We aim to run services, activity, and events that benefit the broad range of Syrian 
in Brighton and Ho and the entire Sussex area. Uh, we, our aim was to bring Syrian people living in Sussex area together to spend time together, make friendship and build a sense of community to provide practical support to the Syrian people living in Sussex, particularly to those who have recently arrived to help them settle in UK and to integrate in the society and to be a positive citizens as they have left everything behind and they are going to start with a new life for them. The language was the first bearer for most of them and us, you can say. Uh, we are trying to take part in many different uh, courses and activities just to make sure that they are improving themselves and also to have practical courses to support themselves to build a new life for their family. Also to be open to all Syrian people and living in Sussex regardless of their, as I said, political point of view or ethnic or whatever. Uh, to get involved in the community life and also in the life in general here. The culture, you know, it's a bit uh, different between here and there. So our uh, duty just to make sure that to connect the two cultures. Uh, we do have support and started when we started from the Brighton and Hove City Council from the Sussex Community Foundation, which we do thank them a lot, Trust Development Center and Brighton College. Uh, we generally, and before the pandemic, uh, we used to have our uh, school for children. Uh, for the adults one, we do have also practice your English, uh, as we do have also a homework club for the students who in need for some help and support in their language and their homework if they do need anything in math, English, science. The same goes for the students who are doing the GCSEs and the A-level, which is a little bit difficult of what we used to have over there. Uh, we do also have a homework club, as I said, to support all of our students. Plus, we do have a music school. Uh, you can say it's mixed between the foreign music and the Arabic or the Orient music, which is a little bit different. I think the musician do understand what's the difference in between. And also to spread our culture. Uh, so where we do participate, either for ourselves or maybe to take part in some other uh, events around Sussex area. And in London, uh, we do have some of our musicians who teach from time to time at uh, one college in London for the music one. And we have query for our children where we do have also one in two languages. We do have one in Arabic and the other one in Aramic, the Jesus language. Uh, that was part of our school when we run it, but unfortunately through the pandemic period of time, it was really difficult for all of us. Uh, I do believe that. And we used to run these courses online uh, through Zoom or Windows team or Google team, you know, all of this uh, social conference uh, connection. As we do have one of the important courses we run, which called the Life in the UK course, as you are a foreigner, a foreigner, you have to apply for the British citizen and you have to pass that test. So we do have 
a course for that one. Uh, during the pandemic time, we run it online and we were on ITV and the BBC for this uh, information. You may find it on the YouTube, I think. Uh, also, we do have our drop-in services every week on Wednesdays uh, to help and support maybe anybody who got any form or application or need to translate some letters he received or maybe so to to just log into to their universal credit uh, page as i said the language is a little bit difficult for most of them but now they have improved and they're getting better even we celebrate with one of our party we held uh, two years ago, it, it used to be called Bright Light from Syria, where we have some videos. It was a cultural night, uh, having poetry and uh, from Syria in Arabic, some Syrian music and Syrian food uh, to enjoy. So it was really a very nice event. And usually we do run every year, like Christmas party, uh, to, to let people come together and enjoy being together, listening to the music of uh, our country as enjoying the Syrian food, dancing, just having nice time to remember. The same goes with other events, which is like uh, the Easter party, we do have one, the Syrian Mother Day party. We do have uh, also Eid party for the first one after Ramadan. And uh, the other Eid we usually comes in summer or nearly summer times, it depends. Uh, so we do have a summer barbecue where we send invitation to all of our community member where we do have our a private Facebook group. Anybody is welcome to join us and know more about it. Uh, we do have some support from many other organizations here in the local area where in East or West Sussex. Uh, we do support our uh, family of low income to have uh, with BESCO company to have some uh, support with their energy bills and also to have a warm home discount every year they might apply for. Uh, the Life in the UK course was on ITV. You can find it on YouTube also. Uh, as I said, we do ha have Christmas party, Santa Claus, to give gifts to the children. Uh, last one we attend before the pandemic, it was about 250 people and about 90 child. Uh, the Easter party also, we do give uh, chocolate eggs and some other uh, gifts to the children. Uh, on the Mother Day party, we do give gifts to the ladies, to our ladies. Uh, as I said, the bright light of Syria was a cultural night for us. Our services, uh, Brighton and Hove, Coldeen, Wooding Dean, Borslade, Southwick, Hastings, Lansing, Shoreham by Sea, uh, something, Lansing, Shishistar, Bognor Rangers, uh, Seaford, Beast Haven, New Haven, Hearst, Monsh, Sio, Hailsham, Heatherfield, and East Grinstead, uh, where usually we just try to bring all of them together. I do thank you a lot for your help and support, and I do thank everybody to their Help, to their help to us.
Thank you so much, Ahmad. That's, I mean, it's amazing to hear the work that you do to support the families in this way and what a wonderful range of activities for people to enjoy and share and to share culture, to improve lives, but also that opportunity, like you say, to really integrate and the opportunity of, of life here. So thank you so much. Um, so on to our third speaker, final speaker, Jenny Johnson from Brighton Women's Centre. Um, I hand over to you, Jenny, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, please do let me know if you can't see my slides or you can't hear me. Unfortunately, due to our COVID restrictions, I have to sit right by an open window. So please do excuse any background noise that you hear. So my name is Jenny Johnson. I've been working at the Brighton Women's Centre just since the middle of August. Uh, I'm quite new, so please do bear with me as I share about our work for the next 10 minutes or so. I'll be sharing an introduction to BWC, a little bit about our clients, both before and during the pandemic, as well as a little bit about our response to the pandemic. Brighton Women's Centre has been supporting women since 1974, offering holistic to support to women with a variety of needs, often multiple overlapping needs. Our mission is that we want to give every woman the freedom, the support and the power to change her life, making things better for her, for those around her and for society. We know that each woman is an individual with her own history, her own challenges and her own hopes. We give her whatever kind of support she needs. Sorry, my lines have gone a bit crazy there. We understand that the problems in women's lives can sometimes come from a deeper root cause. And so using connected services, we work to improve all parts of her life. Through our work with each individual, we fight social injustice and advocate for gender equality. Ultimately, we give women and wider society the strength to succeed. EWC is a very small organization, but we offer a wide array of services to ensure we provide holistic care to women with often multiple and overlapping needs. These include our women's accommodation support service, offering support and advice to women who are homeless or insecurely housed, we offer counselling and other forms of therapy. Our Inspire service supports women who are in the criminal justice system, from when they appear in court to when they're leaving prison or on probation or in the community. Our peer-to-peer -peer service offers a number of groups for women to support each other, including a group for women over 50. We offer affordable and free childcare for ages zero to five. Our volunteer services include a food bank, helpline and various drop-ins. We also have a musculoskeletal service for women with chronic conditions and multiple needs. As you can see, we are able to offer a wide variety of services that as a new member of staff, honestly, I am still getting my head around. However, each of our services is consistently underpinned by our values of offering holistic trauma-informed care that recognizes that most of the women, whatever service they're in, they have experienced trauma in their lives that has led to multiple other problems and our support needs to be sensitive to what they've been through and work through that with them without doing further harm. As I'm new to the team and I'm kind of have uh, an outsider perspective, I can honestly say that my colleagues who do this work are an absolutely incredible bunch of women working so hard in really difficult circumstances to support some of the most vulnerable people in our community and the work that they are able to deliver with very limited and challenged resources is amazing. Next slide, please. A large proportion of our clients have multiple and complex needs. All of them have experienced trauma, with a very high number having experienced domestic violence to some extent, either as a child or as an adult. For example, the government's female offender strategy claims that almost 60% of female offenders have experienced domestic abuse, but actually we believe, and many others believe, the true number is much higher than 60%. This is actually true across all our services, even though we don't run a specific service explicitly for domestic violence, all our services have a very high proportion of women who have experienced violence. For example, in the year until March 2021, of the women who were referred to us from the NHS with musculoskeletal issues, such as rheumatoid arthritis and chronic pain, so a service, nothing explicitly to do with domestic violence, of, those, of the referrals, 27% of women reported that domestic violence was something that they needed our help with. 
Next slide, please. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, BWC had to adapt our services to keep our staff and service users safe, many of whom were very vulnerable. Our staff had to adapt to the different requests that were of support and advice that were responding to our service users' needs. By April 2020, our staff had already noticed an increased number of requests for help relating to domestic violence. This was also widely reported in the press. Sorry, another siren going fast. Violence is not caused by the pandemic or by any external circumstances. It is caused by the perpetrator who chooses to be violent and is responsible for that. However, existing situations of domestic violence were made worse by the situations of the pandemic. For example, women were stuck in the house with the perpetrator all day, every day. Children who would otherwise be at school and have the abuse hidden from them were exposed to violence. Women who uh, experienced domestic violence also had many coping strategies taken away by the pandemic, for example, were then unable to access support systems and family and friends. Women who wanted to flee or access support struggled because many services closed or were altered, such as refuges, which had to stop taking new clients or close altogether. It wasn't only domestic violence for our clients that was exacerbated by the pandemic. Our clients had worsening issues with physical and mental health, isolation and loneliness, digital isolation, insecure or inappropriate housing, relationship breakdown, including with children, alcohol, substance misuse and worsening poverty. Next slide, please. All our services that were face to face had to close or adapt. With some government funding support, uh, most services went virtual or via a phone call. We were able to give out some tablets and phones to service users who otherwise wouldn't have the technology to be able to access support and advice services. But unfortunately, other services had to close. For example, we were unable to run drop-ins or the food bank. So with the help of some SCF funding, we started a helpline. This allowed service users to access advice and support, and we could signpost them to other services in Sussex as well, as well as offering support through BWC. The helpline had a high number of calls relating to domestic violence or coercion, including people needing legal advice or accommodation support. It was largely the same group of women, uh, not individuals, but as a target community, it was largely the same sorts of issues that we were hearing about pre-COVID. For example, multiple overlapping needs requiring holistic trauma-informed care and access to multiple services. In some ways, Moving most of our services online broadened the access as some of the geographical or physical barriers were removed. But for others, accessing telephone or virtual services has been a real challenge. Some women don't have access to technology or a phone and others, particularly in situations of domestic violence, don't have a safe private space they can talk. Some of my colleagues were talking to women who were locked in a bathroom or kept being interrupted or were whispering so as not to be overheard because they just were not in a position of safety to have that conversation. Despite these challenges, BWC continued to offer holistic trauma-informed care, doing everything they could to support each individual in whatever they needed, seeing the woman as the expert in her own life with her own strengths, hopes, and plans. Final slide, please. Please excuse the random lines as well, they've gone a bit wonky. I want to share a recent story of one of our clients uh, that shows how our clients have had extra difficulties due to COVID and needed some expert advice and support. The name and some of the details of this story have been changed, as of course this is not a photo of a real client. Uh, we need to protect the privacy of our service user. Becca is a 25-year-old woman who was kicked out by her violent partner and was sleeping in a park. Her GP made us aware that she had health issues making her extremely vulnerable to COVID-19 and that made rough sleeping incredibly dangerous. She had a part-time job and was hoping to start a new role soon, but she had nowhere to live. She had tried to organise her place to stay and had been offered a place to live with a family, but this was withdrawn as it wasn't COVID safe. Initially, the council were reluctant to support or believe her. But through advocacy from BWC, Becca was given temporary accommodation while we supported her to find a long-term solution in a flat chair. 
Her partner wouldn't let her back in to get her things. So we found her a grant for some basic goods and a rent deposit. We helped her access benefits and the food bank. Despite all her challenges, she is starting her new role soon, alongside ongoing therapy and practical support and emotional support from our amazing team at BWC. So thank you for listening to Becca's story and thank you for listening to the BWC story. Thank you to SCF for ongoing support and for hosting me today. I look forward to answering your questions and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, that's, you know, the wide ranging and impressive support is, 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 is really great, especially from such a small organisation, as you say. But also, you know, we heard so much in the media during COVID about domestic abuse. And I think it's interesting to hear that kind of local lived experience of women in Brighton and those issues exacerbated, as you say, but also what the response has been by BWC to, to support. So thank you ever so, ever so much, that was really interesting. Can I encourage people as well to keep putting questions in through the chat box, um, there's still time. We would now like to welcome back all of our speakers for the Q&A session. Um, so please do put those questions into the chat box. If we can't answer them today, we will later. Um, but also here, we will also be inviting Stephen Chamberlain, Head of Philanthropy at Sussex Community Foundation, to join us to answer your questions. So thank you for joining us, Stephen. So if I can start with the first question, I think I'll go to Jackie first. Uh, so you can do a first one. Um, could you tell us whether Lewis CAB's own funding is an increasing problem in that does it mostly come from local authorities? And if so, has that become harder in the last year? Yeah, this is sort of like my dream question, Corinne. Um, <laughs> um, we get the majority of our funding from Lewis District Council, um, a, a really sizable amount um, on which we rely heavily to continue our work. And in the last year, the uh, councillors have decided to go for a competitive bidding process, which we are in the middle of now. So I am putting a bid into the council to continue our funding. Uh, which we won't hear if we won it until mid-February next year. So there is a chance that by mid-February next year, we will lose 70% of our funding. And we have six weeks to work out how we're going to continue our service. So yes, our funding is under threat at the moment. Um, obviously, I hope that the bid I write will be successful. We will get our funding. But if it's not and the competitor comes in, or an external agency from outside Lewis comes in, then we may lose all our funding from Lewis District Council. Yes, so I absolutely um, fear for our future if we lose that money. Oh, goodness. Well, good luck with that, Jackie. I, Thank I, you. I don't know how you kind of build contingency into that kind of um, time frame in terms of going forward. So good luck. Thank you. Um, I hope Lewis District Council are listening somewhere on the Yeah, call. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send the link. We'll send the link across. Um, my second question is to Ahmed. Um, you, your, your presentation outlined that you have some very young children and also some much older people in your community. Um, yes, do you indeed. find different ages settle to life in the UK easier than others? And, um, and how do you support their needs with this? Well, well, I can tell you that it's a bit difficult for the elderly people, uh, as we do have so many of them. Uh, also, many family of our community, either the parents disabled or the children. We do have three children for one family who are disabled and they receiving treatment and care here. Uh, the rest of our community, yes, it, they find it, as I told you, as, as soon as you getting older, you find it a bit difficult just maybe for the language to learn some more skills. And uh, for the young, I can tell you now, most of our children, if you met them in the street, you will never recognize that they are Syrian. So they just mixed perfectly with others. Uh, I can give you an example of my son. When he started at the school at Hove Junior School, uh, they used to call him the smiley boy, where he started just smiling. But by the end of the year, 
his teacher told me we used to call him the smiley boy but now we ask him to stop talking <laughs> <laughs> yes as i told you now my family my children they speak english most of the time they rarely to use the arabic language uh, maybe some other family goes the same all of their children are uh, speaking perfectly english they have friends they have mixed very well with the community here they have so many uh, activity and taking part in some sports and maybe uh, group like youth group uh, together sleeping over and going around uh, sometimes just walking on the sea side uh, which is really very nice i do feel i'm really happy that they are acting like any other children uh, the elderly one and the disabled was really difficult for us to to look after and help to support to give them some extra care as they are mostly spend their time during the lockdown at home and they need somebody to just even talk to them so we do support some sort of uh, mental health for them and also we make like every day or every other day it depends about the case with us uh, just to make them feel that somebody care and look after them asking them what do you want us to to get you from the market or if they need for their medication to be delivered home uh, we also help with so many uh, gift cards, uh, which we receive grants from Sussex Community Foundation and other organization to help them with. And also we have spread lots of food parcels to help them. Uh, as I told you, mostly for the old one, as they are a little bit hard for them to to start with their english but in the same time we do have so many of our, our people who speaks really very good english and now in that uh, in that event i told you bright light from syria about the culture and mixing it with other culture to make something special uh, we celebrate by that time uh, for 10 of our students who went to the university at and uh, many different uh, area of study where we do have some of them are uh, chemists, others are uh, computer engineers, software engineers, some others business management. Uh, one of our students who came by lorry cross <laughs> the sea over to UK, he received a scholarship from Oxford University to study math. He's very brilliant one. Within two years of being here in UK, he got five A plus in That's five different subjects. It's a wonderful yes. story. And I think, you know, you really illustrate the importance yes. of a place for that community to come together, but also be part of and become the community here. And um, yes, I, yes, I think, yes. Yeah, and we, we are we are always very open and friendly. So we like meeting. We like giving big hugs and kisses. <laughs> That's our, my kind of place. <laughs> I think you know that kind of leads to my next next question for for Jenny. Um, is that you know, it strikes me that you have women from all backgrounds um, for, for the British, for the Brighton Women's Centre. So compared to the, the Syrian community group. So how how are people referred to you? How do they know to come to you? And what's that kind of process look like? Thank you. That's a, a really good question. And um, I what something I should have said is that even though we are called the Brighton Women's Centre, actually, we operate all over Sussex, East Sussex, West Sussex and uh, some of Kent. As, as I mentioned, we have um, many different services and each, um, each service kind of has its own referral pathway. So people can hear about us multiple, multiple ways. We get a lot of people hearing about us and referring themselves, whether that's through the website or, uh, you know, and saying, I've seen you do therapy or I've seen you do a food bank. 
We also have uh, the, the INSPIRE project working in the criminal justice system is largely funded through the Ministry of Justice. So all of the referrals for that programme come through probation officers, um, sentencing people such as judges and other people in the courts. And those come through official Ministry of Justice, criminal justice pathways. But we also have links with local GPs. We have, uh, we're, we're one of the partners in the, in the Community Roots Partnership, which is mental health in, I think that is just Brighton and Hove. Um, but we get referrals from multiple partners, multiple channels. We try and be as open as we possibly can. Um, and we very rarely, very, very rarely would turn anybody away. Thank you. Um, well, that's been fantastic from all of our speakers. I'd like to hand over to Stephen for a roundup and thanks and a goodbye. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Corinne, and um, thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers today, Jackie, Ahmad and Jenny, and, uh, and in particular for, for everything that you, your teams, your volunteers do for people who need that really informed and really specialist advice and support. It, it's just been wonderful hearing from you today, so thank you. As, as a local grant maker, it's very important for all of us at Sussex Community Foundation to hear from the huge variety of charities and community groups working in Sussex. And, and you've told some really powerful stories today that has really helped bring this work to life. Um, so it's a, re a real privilege to have you here today. As Corinne said, our series of Sussex Uncovered webinars, uh, which follows on from our, our Sussex Uncovered reports and our website, uh, they're designed to help shine a light on and to raise awareness of different issues locally and the amazing work being done in our communities in Sussex. We really have learned a lot today and we really hope that you have too. If you would like to find out more about what you've heard about today, or might even be in a position to help or would like us to connect you with today's speakers, please do get in contact with us after the webinar. We, we know that the, that the economic uh, and other fallouts from, from the pandemic, as, as all the speakers have, have spoken about, uh, will continue for, for some time to come. And we now know that in addition to those who might be new to poverty at this time, um, the, the cohort which, which Jackie described, uh, the situation um, for those who are already experiencing disadvantage or inequality has also been exacerbated. So I think what we've learned here is that people who might be trying to trying to navigate a complex or stretched benefit system for the first time or to progress through the immigration process or perhaps might be experiencing a combination of mental health and economic challenges. This must just be simply overwhelming at this time. And it's within, it's within that context, I think, um, that the work and the expertise of voluntary sector groups like those we've heard from today is just absolutely critical. And whether that's provided by, by paid employees or by volunteers, that advice we know we've heard from is delivered with integrity and it's delivered with compassion. And it's, it's backed up by organisations with years and years of experience working in these really complex situations. It, it's work that is rarely shouted about from the rooftops, but those who do it really are unsung heroes. We do hope that you will join us at the next Sussex Community Foundation webinar. That takes place on the 18th of November, and that's also going to serve as our annual meeting for this year. Linking in with the COP26 United Nations Climate Change Conference, which takes place in Glasgow early in November, we will be focusing on environmental sustainability and climate change and the amazing work being done in that area here in Sussex. In the meantime, uh, from all of us at Sussex Community Foundation, thank you again to our three speakers today. Many of you, our guests, are also part of this inspiring voluntary sector here in Sussex. And it's been really great, uh, actually, to see some connections being made uh, in the chat, uh, in the seminar today. Uh, others of you here today are part of our community of fund holders and our donors. And of course, that enables us to do 
uh, the work that we do in supporting these amazing groups. So thank you all for everything you do. And thank you for joining us today. Do enjoy your evenings and goodbye.